Hello, I'm Paul Wells. This is chapter five of the story of Plug and Plink. Links in the description for the previous chapters. So, in the previous chapter, uh, I talked about how I had done about six months work with uh, the product designer, choosing materials, etc. Um, but the arrangement I also had with the product designer was that we, um, well, I would look after the uh, app, the website, and sending notes over the internet, and the product designer would uh, take care of, yes, obviously the product design, the industrial design, but also the electronics design as well. And that was a good arrangement because what it means is that the, um, you know, there's a, a bit of back and forth normally between these two because the electronics designer asked the question, well, how much space have I got to work in? And the product designer says, well, how much space do you need? So it was good that that was dealt with that way. And <clears throat> so uh, a meeting was set up with a, an electrical engineering, electronics engineering company that the uh, product designer had worked with in the past. And um, I spent one Sunday afternoon writing as good a specification as I could of what all of the requirements were. And we met at this company's offices, um, but I'll admit, I could tell from the outset, this wasn't going very well. Um, first of all, the guy hadn't read the document, so he didn't actually know what the product was. He also admitted that uh, he hated piano, um, as a child, he'd been forced to take piano lessons and, and hated it ever since. He didn't like music. Um, he was strongly trying to manage my expectations and he said, well, if I were you, I'd carry on with the Raspberry Pi. I said, well, yes, but what about the problem that, you know, this Raspberry Pi is about that big. Uh, the head of the snake is actually going to be quite, uh, quite large and cover the piano keyboard. Uh, and he was saying, well, in that case, then you'll have to give up on it being a design like a snake and you'll have to switch over to just having a box around the back of the piano and a strip of lights that, that lie on the piano. So I wasn't happy anyway. Um, left the meeting. We got a quote from this guy um, a couple of days later. I, I bet he didn't spend even 10 minutes writing the quote. Um, and... He wanted £12,000 anyway, which is not a lot of money for a medium company or a large company, but for somebody just paying for it out of savings, it's, it's quite a lot of money. Um, the product designer agreed that this wasn't a particularly good deal, um, so we walked away from it. I would like to tell you about something quickly. Um, many, many years ago, I uh, read a book called The Mythical Man Month, and um, this book's a very short book and it's, uh, it's just a description. Um, it's, just a, it's just a set of essays on software engineering. And the picture that stuck in my mind was um, on one of the essays, it described a, a square made up of nine smaller squares. And the square in the top left represented the situation whereby somebody creates a product on their own, um, just a prototype, just a proof of concept. Um, but what the book was saying was the other squares to the side of that square, it takes three times the effort to go from something that just proves a point to something you'd actually call stable and robust. Well, anyway, um, the other thing about it, about the square, is it also says if you want to go from a single person working on something to a whole team of people working on something, then you've got another factor of three. So expect it to take nine times as long to build something that you just built on your own. Well, with this principle in mind, I thought, okay, wouldn't it be better if instead of hiring a large company, because this product's not that large, um, it's only 
USB, a light strip, Bluetooth, that's essentially it. Maybe this is something which, you know, one good uh, electronics engineer could build on their own. So uh, anyway, about a week later, the product designer contacted me and said, uh, yeah, I've met somebody at a conference. Uh, this guy works on his own. He spends all of his time reading about different chips. Um, do you want us to hire him? Maybe he can do it. So uh, I said, yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, so remember the, the, the contract, the, the agreements with the, uh, the product designer. And so, yeah, that's what we, that, that's what we did. I got a phone call um, about, about a week later from this guy. In the, in, in the UK, in the late 1970s, there was a uh, TV comedy program, sketch program called Not the Nine O'Clock News. I just remember a sketch on there where an older gentleman walks into a shop and asks to buy a gramophone and two very amused young salesmen oh, just making fun of him basically for his lack of knowledge and teasing him with the sort of questions that they ask. It was a little bit like that. I got asked, what type of Bluetooth would you like? You can have, well, what types are there? Oh, well, there's, there's sorry, not, uh, yeah, Bluetooth. Uh, well, there's Bluetooth low energy. Do you want Bluetooth low energy? I said, well, I don't really know, to be honest. Uh, um, what type of USB would you like? Um, you can have USB-A or you can have USB-C. Um, or right, which would look better as the, uh, on the ends of the tongue of a snake. Um, but more significantly, um, the conversation went on uh, and the question came up. So this is like the little boxes moving across. Yes, I'd built it on my own, but other questions crept in. How are you gonna shut this thing down? I mean, you, when you shut your phone down, you actually request to shut it down. You don't force it to shut down. It could be in the middle of doing something critical. And uh, so I realized, well, yes, this thing is gonna need a, some sort of rechargeable battery to power the Raspberry Pi so that then other users, if they just pull the plug on it, they weren't interrupted in the middle of doing something critical. So that was one issue. Another thing that uh, the electronics guy told me was, you can use something called a Raspberry Pi Zero, which will be a lot smaller um, and only a fraction of the cost. So uh, yeah, that conversation happened. Now, you may or may not know this, but what happens when you hire an electronics designer, uh, they go away for a few days, they think about it, they come up with a design, and then they give you three files. And these three files are, well, the first one is the schematic, the logical view of the electronics. And that's what another electronics engineer would be interested in seeing. It's what I would have called the circuit diagram. The second file that you get is the physical, the physical design. That's something that you send away to a factory and it describes the shape of the printed circuit board and it describes how the tracks run along the printed circuit board and that sort of thing. And then the third file that you get is a CAD file. And the CAD file is given to the product designer who then continues the CAD and produces the housing that supports and protects the electronics. So these things came through quite quickly anyway. Um, but what I didn't understand that's somewhat of a disadvantage of, uh, of using a single guy working on his own is whereas a company would possibly have the facilities for fabricating these boards on site, the uh, single guy working on his own, he just sends these files off and then two or three weeks later, they come back in the post to him, at which point he then sets to work using a very powerful magnifying glass and a very steady hand, soldering the components onto the board to make the first working model. And he usually does that three times. He'll have one for himself, one for the product designer, and then one for me to look at. He sent me some video of this thing working. He'd also made the light strip. I'd specified the gap on the lights so that they would fit correctly on a piano. And 
this had come back and it was on flexible circuit board so that the snake could coil its body. So all was looking fairly good um, until I got hold of it and plugged it in and just a random set of lights came on, nothing interesting happened. Um, and I went back to the guy and I said, you know, what's, what, what's going on? And uh, there were problems and he was saying, oh, well, you know, there's, there are instabilities in the signal to the, to the uh, light strip and stuff like that. Um, and I could see we'd got serious problems. Now, under normal circumstances, I would have said, look, you know, this hasn't met the contractual obligations. Um, you know, I'm not going to carry on with it. But this was a contract with the product designer and I was happy with the product designer and it taken me ages to find the product designer. So I, I didn't want to walk away from this. So I was thinking, how, how can I salvage something from it? Um, okay, I mean, interestingly, he charged a third of the price of the first guy. So, so it had been £4,000. So I said, look, what, what would you do if you were me in this situation? And he said, I'd ditch the Raspberry Pi and I'd build it bare metal. Now, I hadn't heard this term used before. I'd heard the term bare metal before, but what he was saying was, get rid of the Raspberry Pi, then instead of writing on top of something which is running an operating system, which is doing goodness knows what, it's got video drivers in it, it's got Wi-Fi drivers in it, it's got all of these components for handling all these different things. You don't really know what it's going to do. Um, I mean, it could, it, it, it could stop working at any time and you wouldn't know why it stopped working. If you build it bare metal, you select the components, you write the firmware, there are only things on it that you need and it only does what you tell it to do. So you've got much, much more control of it. So, okay, I thought this, you know, this, this sounds good. This sounds like it could be fixed. He reckoned it could be fixed in, he could, he could build something in a couple of days. Now he understood what I needed and um, it would be produced for a fraction of the price and it would be much, much smaller anyway. So it sounded all good. So I, I said, okay, fine, go for it. This is what we should have done in the first place. Um, and this was me communicating with the electronics guy directly this time, not via the product designer. So it, it sounded like, like it was worth doing. So this was about end of March, uh, end of March 2019. But then it all slowed down. So after a month, there was nothing to see. A few more weeks. Yeah, the boards, are, the boards had arrived, but... The guy said he had family problems and he'd got other work commitments and things like this. Um, and he didn't finish it off. Uh, the deadline came and went. And by about the end of June, I realized I'm pretty fed up with this guy now. Um, so I went back to the product designer and I said, look, I'm, I, let this guy produce his boards. Um, I'll try and find a firmware writer because that was the best I could try and salvage from it. I'd got, I'd got the light strips. Um, I'd got some printed circuit boards that may or may not be useful. If I go and find a firmware writer, that's, that's about the best we can do because otherwise I can see in another three months we're still not going to be anywhere with this. I wish this chapter had a better ending. I wish that I could say something happened and then it all, all came together, but nothing did. Nothing, nothing worked that way. Um, and sometimes it, it just goes that way. I will pick up the story of the electronics in a future chapter, um, but I'm going to leave it there for the electronics. In the next chapter, chapter six, I'll tell you about starting to produce the app. See you in chapter six.